Uh, Maisie is the niece of Edward Goodale, one of the dog team drivers of this expedition. She became interested in scientific aspects of this exploration after she learned that the president of Carleton College was Lawrence Gould, who had been the leader of the geologic party. He was totally surprised when Eddie informed her of that association on the eve of her departure for Carleton College in 1954. The Goodale family has lived in Ipswich since the late 1890s. Her grandfather, Joseph, founded Goodale Orchards in 1920. It is now owned by the Russell family. So thank you all and welcome Maisie. So I thank you, Terry, and I'm delighted. This program has been five years in the making. Started with Pat Tyler, who is a historian at the museum, many of you must know, in 2013. It's a big year for starting things. Since then, more photos have been collected. I will right now tell you my disclaimer. I have not been to the Antarctic, not even once. <laughs> but uh, I have an idea that some of you have, and I want to know if any of you have, if you would raise your hands. Wonderful. So you can fact check me <laughs> later on. And I'm sure Lisa will have a great many other interesting details about her actual experiences there. So I think we have one story. And each of us has our own interpretation of a story of a legendary bird expedition. This was the first of the bird expeditions to the South Pole in 19, actually 28 to 1930, because they landed uh, and set up Little America in, on Christmas Day of 1928. And then they wintered over, which would have been our summer, and then they made their explorations and they returned in 1930. So. Uh, can we turn on the, <laughs> can we plug it in? <laughs> well, this is the book from which I res got a lot of new information, Edward Stump, 2011. And it has a lovely collection of color photographs, aerial color photographs. But this is a picture of the Live Glacier, and you'll hear more about that. It all started when my dad gave me this little specimen of prenite. And the little three by five card is completely deteriorated, but it said Mount Scott, EEG 1930. So what was that all about? And I was about 10 or 12 at the time when I saw that for the first time. And when I went to Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota in, 19, in 2013, uh, for my 55th <laughs> reunion, I saw this penguin stuffed, his name is Oscar, and next to him on the left is the Amundsen Cairn. You'll hear more about that. So that was another artifact that produced a lot more questions in my mind of what everything was going to be pulled together. And this is a, a picture of Bozo my sister Susan Hay took in 1937. She's 12 years older than I, she couldn't be here tonight, but she has some representatives of the family here, so I'm glad they're here. Bozo came home with Eddie and was very friendly. And the story is that Pat Tyler, who was a contemporary of my first cousin, Evelyn Goodale, was scared to death of these dogs that were roaming around town. And uh, they were very, very friendly. Maybe some of you remember a head of a dog in the Goodale. <laughs> orchard barn for many, many years. <laughs> and, um, just the head. And uh, it was a long time and many, many years before it finally somewhere disappeared. Anyway. Okay. So how are these all connected? And who are the cast of characters? So here are the Goodales on the porch about 1920 down the road. Um, my uh, great-grandmother Henrietta is in the white dress in the front next to her husband, George. And um, Eddie is in the upper left. He would have been about 15. And so this was 1920. And um, well, as the story goes that later on, <laughs> Freddie, Norman, 
uh, were in Harvard and they decided they didn't want to study for exams anymore and they had read a <coughs> very nice article about birds needing dog team drivers. So why stay and study it in books? <laughs> they were going to go. So Norman, being Norman, uh, decided that he would go to Commander Bird's house in Boston, knock on the door and say, I'm here, I'm ready to learn about dog team drivers and my two friends and I have been at Grantville Mission and we know a little bit about uh, cold weather and the hardships. And uh, first uh, he said, well, I don't know. And then he did take them on and sent them up to Wanalancet where Arthur Walden uh, was a very strong disciplinarian with his dogs. And this is a picture of Chinook, his favorite dog. And Arthur did take Chinook to Antarctica. And uh, he was a very strong dog, but he was old. And uh, the story in Little America is heartbreaking because evidently he wandered off after a week or so and was never found, and everybody was in terrible distress about him. But he had lived a good life being a dog, as a dog, <laughs> and he was loved by everybody. So, um, Lawrence Schools, this was part of the exhibit in 2013 at the library at, at Carleton. And this is a, a classic picture of him, much later than the journey to Antarctica. But uh, he presented quite a, a figure on campus. And I remember later in the 50s, he would be very hardy and only wear a, a light coat in the 40 degree below zero <laughs> that it could be in Minnesota. And he said, oh, it's just nothing. And his red tie would be flapping around. <laughs> Had a, he even made a story and a poem about his red ties. I don't know, but he had a he had a persona there. So the next one shows Victor Cheka on the lower right, and he was invaluable. The whole uh, expedition would have had a terrible time if it hadn't been for his rescuing the cook stove, which had blown up the Prima stove, and. Uh, he was the engineer who, at two weeks from, well, from Dunedin, New Zealand, all of a sudden they realized they didn't have any sunglasses. Well, you can't go to Antarctica without sunglasses. So we made 42 pair of them right on the spot. The other uh, interesting thing, the next slide shows the stove, a design. This is from Gould's book. Um, that would enable them to heat water and melt the ice in order for the photographs that McKinley took to be developed. And uh, the problem had been that they would melt the water and by the time they wanted to use it, it had frozen because there was 50 degree difference between the top of the cabin and the, the, the floor. So anyway, he was uh, very, very helpful. And I, I don't know if anybody is a relative or a descendant or know the Czechos, but they, they were remarkable. And they came from Ipswich. So, let's see. Uh, there's so much to be said for Antarctica. Uh, we can't spend the whole evening talking about every exploration of it. But why Antarctica? And uh, I think the next couple of slides show one of the beauties of, of Antarctica, of course, the romance of the penguins and the icebergs. And I'm sure Lisa <laughs> is just entranced by the ice. It can be dangerous, but it is also beautiful. And uh, you can go ahead. This was a theory of Pangaea. And when I was uh, studying geology in the 50s, we didn't talk about Pangaea. What was that all about? And I think later on, the tectonic theory of the plate shifting through fault lines uh, was fairly recently um, 
corroborated in scientific, but they had theories way long ago, uh, even as early as the Scots' first ex expedition in early uh, 19, was it 19, and three, his first ex expedition. And the next one shows a little bit of the separation of Gowana land, which part of it became Antarctica and your Laurasia. This explains a little bit, though, between of the pre prevalence of Finnish stonecutters in Rockport, because the granite, the pink granite we've seen in Rockport quarries is very similar to the pink granite in Finland. And that was part of the clue, you might say, of one of the clues to draw these thing, pe these continents together. Yeah. Sort of like a reverse time-lapse photograph, if you yeah. can imagine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So here, next. Oh, that was good. I have bigger. The next is, I think, just Antarctica part of it. Okay. So, of course, South Pole is at the, at the bottom. Well, everything is north. It's a matter of what degree of piece of pie the latitude <laughs> emanates out. Um, it's, it's watching and looking at some of these maps is a little confusing, but most of the explorations landed at the Ross Ice Shelf, which uh, is up near the Bay of Whales. And then they moved in inland from there. There were many explorers, and I think we'll just go ahead. Here, <coughs> one of the earliest <laughs> was Friedrich Nansen, 1895. And he is actually pulling the sledge, himself, though the people were pulling. And that's where the term pulling into history came from a lot of the uh, documents. Roald Amundsen and Robert Scott got into a race to the pole, and many of you may have read a lot about that. But when Scott got to the South Pole, he was 34 days behind Amund Amundsen, and that is Amundsen's tent with the Norwegian flag. Hmm. Well, Scott was a little discouraged by that, but yeah. <laughs> He had taken ponies on that uh, trip, as well as dogs. And uh, the ponies didn't do very well. They kept sliding around, and Scott had forgotten the snowshoes. So I don't know. Equipment was so important. And uh, if you forgot your sunglasses, I mean, you had to have <laughs> something to um, do. So each exploration learned from the one previous. And by the time uh, Bird went in 28, uh, he had learned much from Amundsen, and especially what to do about food on the trail. We'll go along yeah, later. This is one of the maps, the 3D maps from the Edward Stump, the new book. And it shows all the trails I'm not going to have time now to go through all of them, but the Google party is the yellow one near the top. Okay. So next is, is another picture of the Ed Eleanor Balling. The reason they took this old heap was because it had enough room for the airplanes. Even the, even the airplanes, they had to dismantle and then reattach the wings later on when they uh, needed them. On the left is Bird talking to Larry Gould about plans for this expedition into the Queen Maud range, and so what the route would be. And here, a classic photo of the team, the geologic team, and you have uh, Eddie, we have Eddie, and I think it, uh, the names were up there, but, um, so far, yeah. yeah. Gould is second, I think that's Norman, and then Gould, and Freddie, and Mike Thorne. Yeah. Mike Thorne was the fourth uh, dog team driver. 
Okay. So this is what they ate. And uh, I won't read it all, but basically oatmeal, sugar, milk, sugar, milk, uh, uh, powdered, of course, and uh, powdered lemon. That was for the scurvy, but then nobody had any problem with that. Peanut butter, pemmican, and down at the supper, they made a stew of pemmican called hoosh, and hoosh was the, the food for the gods when they came back from any of these long treks, they didn't really care, as long as it was warm and <laughs> provided the nutrients they needed. But I thought that was kind of interesting. That's in Gould's yeah. book, Cold. This is, this is the book of it, classic. And everybody at Carlton has to read it. <laughs> so I, I haven't read it all the way through, but it has some interesting, interesting it's a text. Okay. So here is the Floyd Bennett aircraft being shoveled out and it's getting ready to fly reconnaissance flights to help this geological party set up base and um, camps along the way, supply posts. <clears throat> and this is from another book uh, by Paul Carter. Paul Carter is a, a geologist in Arizona at the time Gould was retired he spent a lot of time in Arizona uh, speaking in a, as an emeritus professor there. And this book was from 1979 and has a lot of other photographs. And I think these were Gould's own personal photographs. I hadn't seen them before. Okay. Uh, this is from that too. Um, this is the sled being all uh, packed up and getting ready to go into the Mall Mountain. Pat, Tyler, and I thought we really should talk mostly about the dogs, but there's so much more. Anyway, they were setting out uh, over this terrain as Truji is this very frozen ripple. And if you can imagine the beach ripples, about, <laughs> I don't know, three times higher and deeper, frozen and having to run a sled over this very rough terrain. <laughs> a sled, this is the typical sledge used. It was a, a patterned after the Norwegian style. Norwegian one, okay. Okay, here are some of the favorite dogs. I believe that uh, Shackleton, they always named their dogs after yeah. famous <laughs> people. Shackleton had gone with um, Scott, so he had been a, an Arctic dog too. And then uh, Al Smith was his, uh, was his son. In the earliest uh, account that was published right after, we found this map. And I have a copy of that over here. I believe that someone, I, one of the Sherquists gave it to me. Um, and it's an invaluable account because it's really right, it's like a journal, right, that happened right after the, after the expedition. And it, it does explain where they had the posts and um, where they were coming down to the South Pole. It's not as fancy as the ones in the, <laughs> colored editions, but that's authentic in 1930. Mm -hmm. And here they are all in the, taking a, a, their lunch of uh, peanut butter and crackers and maybe a little chocolate uh, the, on the slopes of Mount Manson. And they were following Frizz Trail, one of the earliest. And this is the Ammons and Cairns. This is another map. And uh, in those mountains are three peaks for Crockett and Vaughn and Goodale, as well as Thorne and all the other people. And here is the Gould Cairn. So this is the Gould Cairn, and this is the uh, picture in the, in the stump, later stump book. So. Okay, when Scott went in 1903. He had a scientist named Hartley Farrar, 
Hartley Farrar discovered that the sandstone that he discovered had layers of bituminous material and obviously there had been evidence of some uh, flora there at some time. Some kind, this is one of the pictures, it's an exaggerated picture probably, but it is an important scientific discovery. And the idea being, that they, they weren't sure just how much of this sedimentary layered uh, coal, they called beacon sandstone, uh, was to be found. And it was Gould who discovered that there was a whole stretch of it on the tabular mountains, stretching almost all the way across the continent that he uh, surmised that it was much bigger. So he wrote back to um, that no symphony I have ever heard, no work of art before which I have ever stood in awe, ever gave me quite the thrill that I had when I reached out after the strenuous climb and picked up a piece of rock to find it sandstone. It was just the rock I had come all the way to Antarctic to find. Uh, that was after a very strenuous climb up a mountain. I don't know if we have time. What are we doing? No. I think this is something I ought to read, if I, if I can see it a little bit. We became so absorbed in our work collecting, in our rock collecting, that we ha didn't notice the gathering clouds. Quite suddenly, we were completely engulfed. We hastened to snap on our skis and to tie fast our ropes, thinking that we would be able to see our tracks and retrace our steps. But the snow had been so hard where we had climbed up that we had made scarcely any tracks. Then it began to snow, and we all began to be a little bit nervous. <laughs> we started across the slippery slope with the big crevasse that we would, that could not, we could not now see, but which we knew was waiting with its mouth open for us, just a few feet below. Only Mike kept his balance throughout my time after time. The rest of us slipped and fell grabbing at the snow axe as we, grabbing at the snow as we did so to keep from sliding down the slope. Fortunately, we did not all slip at once, else Mike would not have been able to hold all three of us. We could sort of take turns falling without too greatly endangering the safety of the rest. The snowfall was not great, and when we came to the saddle from which the steep slope led down to the level of our camp, we could see our tracks. After we had crossed the ice falls, we knew that there were no dangerous crevasses between us and the bottom of the slope. So we took off our awkward ropes in order that we might descend with greater freedom. Even with all my rocks on his back, Mike slid gracefully down to the bottom. Freddy followed him and really did rather well. But it was too steep for persons no more adept at negotiating steep slopes than Eddie and I. We tried to follow the example set by the other two, and we slipped and fell and bounced around a good deal, then finally swallowed our pride, sat flat down on our skis, and disgracefully slid to the bottom of the slope. <laughs> Eddie, who proved himself in the course of the summer to have keen eyes, was the first to discover bits of lichen on some of the rocks that we had reached that day. It interested us greatly to realize that this was the farthest south that life of any sort had been found. Well, that was kind of interesting. That was rather... Well, so... Let's run along. We have a few more just to... At the end, um, Bernd Balschen, who was an aviator on one of the flights, uh, made this nice watercolor. And it was signed by all the people on the 
the, the whole expedition for Gould, and the dog teams are climbing up the slope on the left, and Gould is evidently taking surveys at the top. Anyway, it's kind of a nice. Uh, I, I, that just sort of, I, I had a lump in my throat when I saw that. I don't know why, but it was something. Okay. And at the end, this is what they look like <laughs> at the end of the trip. And uh, you, can, you can pick out your, <laughs> your favorite uh, <laughs> scruffy. <laughs> but my goodness, they really were uh, quite a crew. Okay. So they got the gold medal at the Congressional um, Celebration in Washington, and uh, they all got one. This was Gould's that I actually saw and took a picture of. Um, it's also online, but I don't know where any of the others have ever landed. I haven't been able to find them, anybody having one. But anyway, it has a picture of the dog team. It's very special. And the life after the expedition, of course, Bird went on in 1934 again, and uh, this is a nice citation for him. Uh, he wrote a couple of books later on. Um, Alone was his masterpiece of 1934. He barely uh, escaped asphyxiation by carbon monoxide, and they rescued him, but he was alone on the uh, in his post at that time. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's some of his other books. I sent a lot of these books Eddie had and I had collected to Carlton Library because I figured it might inspire some, some foolhardy young men to go on exploration of this kind. Or maybe they'd, they'd dump their, their exam books too, you know. I don't know. Yeah, okay. And Norman. And uh, Harvard, uh, this is some, uh, in his 89th year, he uh, climbed his mountain, Mount Vaughan. And uh, it was all written up in the Harvard uh, Bulletin alumni. So they celebrated a lot about it in his dog team and a little collage for it. I just thought it would be nice to have him represented here tonight. And, uh, yeah, and his favorite dog is the next one <coughs> with him. I think that's sweet. <laughs> I don't know the name of all of the dogs. I couldn't figure it. And Norman was amazing. I mean, he, he persisted, and the whole expedition, it was going to happen. You know, he had his moments. So he's climbing his mountain. He was 89. He was, he was 89. Wow. He lived to be 100. And, uh, yeah, I think he died about 19, uh, 2005, something like that. Oh, here, this is off the internet. Uh, that was Mount Goodale on the right. Uh, Mount Goodale had two peaks. Uh, this is evidently, uh, a li they were a little over and a little under 8,000 feet, but there were two of them. And the Mount Armstrong to the left of those two. And uh, Eddie went on to work on, as a meteorolo meteorologist for the Navy and uh, got up in Greenland, which was 1954. And he brought back a nice piece of Labradorite. <laughs> and he worked for the United States Antarctic Research Program, the NSF. Um, we would get wonderful letters from him. And this, this happened to be one that I, I love the stamp, you know, yeah. <laughs> really. Right, yeah. And then he married Sarah Maton right after uh, he got back in 1930. And Evelyn is his daughter on the right in the blue. And her daughter is uh, Robin. And I'm in contact with her. I'm sorry she's not here. She's in California. And her daughter is Deidre. This was in 1982. Of course, everybody's all grown up now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I've been in contact with all of the grandchildren quite frequently. It's nice. Yeah. Oh, here's the test. Okay. <laughs> Fill in the blanks. Where did they go? Well, you can just see that it's like a pie. And um, when you're looking at maps, like, Antarctica seems to twirl around. And I was amused to know that the globe we have here in the museum doesn't show Antarctica mm -hmm. at all. 
although in 1571, in the Otelian Al Atlas, it does show a landmass. It's kind of a Mercator projection, but it does have a landmass at the bottom. Okay, these are the little things that came home. And the thing is, all of this ephemera is now being touted on the internet, and you can buy it, I don't know. It seems so sort of anticlimactic to the real stories. And of course, we're all storytellers, so we can sort of take it or leave it, but there is a wonderful legend, I think, in all of this that we can take along. The Romance of the Labrador. And Grenfell really was a wonderful uh, mission and inspire, inspiration to many, many people. And you know, it's wonderful to have a romance about Antarctica, but you know, it's only work, it only works if everyone comes home safely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so many, many times when you, you have to realize it didn't always happen that way. But we're happy that we can share that tonight. Thank you.